we talked about uh, the links between physics and computing in different contexts, like things like reversible computing a little bit, the ultimate limits of computing, we did a little bit of neuromorphic computing and things like that. What we haven't touched on, which would seem to be the obvious one for physicists, is uh, quantum computing. The thing that is always described as sort of the most mystical element of quantum mechanics, and it, it irritates computer scientists and it irritates physicists. There's a guy called Scott Aronson from a computer science perspective. He really demolishes this myth. Well, the way quantum computing works is you basically set up your system and the, 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 the quantum bit can be in any possible state in all these different parallel universes. And basically, because you're trying all the answers in parallel, that means you can pull out the right answer. That's... Rubbish. Rubbish. Uh, <laughs> There's an awful lot of hype about uh, quantum computing. That doesn't mean that the science and the mathematics and the physics isn't valid. It very much is. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to explain the entirety of quantum computing in 10 minutes. You're not going to get this is exactly how it works in any 10 minute video. But what I really do want to get to the, the, the core of is something called superposition. And that's, this is the thing where almost everything starts to go wrong in terms of descriptions of what's going on with quantum computing. In that, okay, we've got a classical bit that can be zero or one. Then the argument is, well, with a quantum bit, it can be some mixture zero or one. And therefore we can have any possible mixture. And therefore, th because we can have any possible mixture, suddenly your answer, da-da, appears by magic. And it really does seem by magic. Superposition, um, this idea of something being in two states at the same time, always dressed up as this weird, isn't. It really isn't. There are two approaches, two broad approaches to quantum mechanics. There's something called matrix mechanics, which computer scientists love, obviously because it's got matrices and vectors, and it's easy to set up on a computer, and it's easy to, um, uh, to think about lists of numbers and how those interact and how you change those. However, Equivalently, and it is completely equivalently, we have something called wave mechanics because ultimately quantum mechanics is all about the physics of waves. And not just from a very abstract um, perspective in that we can represent these quantities as waves. Here's a whole series of different images taken with something called a scanning tunneling microscope. In this, for example, this is taken from work by IBM quite a number of years ago, or more than 20 years ago at this point. They formed a ring of 48 ion atoms. That's not the good bit. The good bit is if you look inside this ring, it's as if you dropped a stone in a pond. Time and time again, we see these waves. Matter behaves like a wave when you get down to the atomic level. Which means that all of the, the classical physics about waves and all the classical mathematics about waves, we can port into quantum mechanics. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these images, but what you're seeing here each time is how electrons behave right down at the, at the, the atomic level. How does this relate to superposition? Well, superposition is painted as this weird quantum effect, but actually, any time you pick up a musical instrument, you pluck a string, what you have is a superposition of waves on that string. This string can be in a range of different types, variety of different types of modes of oscillation, ways of vibrating. And when you pluck that, you're not just exciting one wave, you're exciting a whole load of waves together. What are those waves? Well, monkey, which is um, making his debut, I think, on computer file. So this is a, a large scale demonstration of a guitar string. And there are special modes of vibration called standing waves or resonances, or if we want to use the mathematical term, and perhaps the term computer scientists are a little bit more familiar with, and a more quantum -y term, eigenstates, special states of the, string, of the string that we can build up any particular pattern of waves on the string using just these particular states. And these resonances, here's the lowest energy one, where we've got what's called an anti-node in the middle, maximum vibration in the middle, and nodes at the end of each string. Now I'm going to try and get the second one. So I have to wiggle a little bit more quickly, as does Monkey. There we go. Okay, so that's our second mode. That's our second special mode, if I can get it right. Uh, I'm blaming the Monkey. So second special mode, or second resonance, or second standing wave, or second harmonic, or second eigenstate. All those... Th Ooh, that was close. <laughs> what have you done? Right. He's got a malicious look in his he face. He has, he definitely does. I think that's the third mode. Yeah. 
Right. So I have to pump in quite a bit more energy for that one, and I'd have to pump in more energy. There's a whole series of these. Here's our um, two points where it was fixed. So I was one end, monkey was the other end. Our first mode looked like that. Our second mode of vibration looked like that. Our third mode of vibration looked like that. And I ran out of steam at that point. But there's a whole host of these all the way up um, in terms of different resonances. And the thing that connects all these, they're the same type of function. It's a sine function. And in terms of the physics of the problem, what when we write down the equation that describes this, our solutions are signs, and what are, what are called our boundary conditions are that it just needs to go to zero here and here. There's an infinite number of these solutions that work on the string. I don't have infinite energy, so I can't excite all of these. Um, but what we can have, and this is key when it comes to superposition and quantum mechanics, is we're not restricted to these. Of course, a string doesn't just vibrate like this or this or this. If I pick up the bass and plug the string, I'll turn around. So this is the first mode, plus the second mode, plus the third mode, plus the fourth, etc., etc. If Sean were to pick up his guitar and play a, an E note on guitar, um, the, exactly the same E note, so if we looked at it in musical notation, it would sound different or better if Sean were to play it on, on piano. It would be the same note, exactly the same note, in terms of a treble clef, in terms of musical notation, but it would sound different. And the reason it sounds different is because we have a different superposition of those resonances. If I play an E note on bass, you play an E note on piano. Can you tell the difference? Well, yeah, you know, you know that you can just hear the different instruments, right? Yeah, you can hear the different instruments. It's the same note, but you can hear the different instruments. The reason you can hear the different instruments is a lot of, although it's the same note, therefore it's the same frequency, therefore repeats with the same period in time, the pattern, the overall pattern is different. And the reason the overall pattern is different or the overall waveform is different is because you have a different mixture of these harmonics on the string. So the, each instrument has its own signature mixture of those particular states on the string, eigenstates on the string, and therefore you have a different superposition. And in terms of quantum computing, it's all about controlling how those different states, on the string in this case, interfere with each other. And you let the system evolve, so you pluck your string, you wait for a certain amount of time for those waves to interfere with each other, and then you make a measurement to pull out the, the overall answer. That is not at all the same as saying that what we do is we have an infinite number of answers and we pull out, you know, we just let it run and as if by magic we pull out an answer. What we have to do is very, very, and when I say I, I'm not involved in developing these algorithms, the people who develop these algorithms have to think very carefully, how do we engineer those waves? How do we engineer those states to interfere with each other? So at the end, when we make a measurement, out pops the result we want. So superposition in that sense is just classical physics. It's been physics that we've known about for two or three hundred years. Of course that's not all there is to quantum. The issue of course is when we um, make a measurement of our quantum system. So for example, imagine this is our measuring instrument. And I plucked that bass string. Okay, we're going to measure what the bass string is doing. And we, we hear it. Quantum mechanically, that's not what happens. Quantum mechanically, we pluck this string, or we set up this quantum state, this um, superposition state. When we then make a measurement, if we make it want to know the energy of, of the string, what happens is that it falls into one of these states with a certain probability. Why? If you know that, you get a Nobel Prize. That's the confusing thing. Not superposition per se. Because superposition, you know, is, is there in classical physics. It's the question of just why, when we make a measurement, it's even called the measurement problem in physics. So we can take our um, guitar string and we can port it all the way down to the quantum level. It's, it's amazing. This is a paper published by uh, Stefan Frolsch's group in Berlin. This is absolutely beautiful work. They've taken indium atoms and they formed a line of indium atoms which acts as a string, basically, along which the electrons can, can, can move. And the red bits represent where there's a high probability of finding electrons. 
and the darker bits, as you can see, represent where there's a low probability of finding electrons. And it's exactly the same as just what we saw on the guitar string. Low at the ends, high in the middle, then when I vibrated monkey a little bit faster, we had um, low peak, um, then we had a minimum, then a maximum, then a minimum. Just as I've drawn on the, on, on the paper. This is right at the quantum level. So this is why f physicists often get very frustrated when quantum mechanics is painted as this incredibly mystical, um, very uh, weird, wacky. It is, it has its elements, but s an awful lot of it is very, very understandable using physics and maths that we've known for a very long time. So where does this go in terms of quantum computing? Well, what we could do is let's say we're going to use the first mode of our quantum string as zero, and the second mode of our quantum string as one. So what we can do is we can have a mixture, a superposition of our zero and one states as a qubit, as a quantum bit. So it's not just zero or one, it can be a mixture of zero and one. So what we have is this and this, and we have some mixture, we have some superposition of just those two states. Right? So we could have 10% of this and 90% of this or 50% of this set or 47% of one, 53% of the other. What I've done here is set up a very simple simulation which basically simulates a, a quantum string in that we've got our zero and our one states in terms of the, the lowest mode and the next, high, the next lowest mode. Just, so just as I demonstrated with the monkey, the first one and the, and the second one. They can be our zero and one in terms of, of a quantum bit, and we can have a mixture of those. So that's what we have. We have 50% mixture of each of those, and here's how it evolves in time. And this is telling us how our probability, the brighter it is, the higher the probability of finding the particle there. This is a quantum particle. And this tells us about the probability. So the wave is telling us about the probability of finding a particle. You can see it's just basically an intensity map of this. All of that is, is pure classical physics. Here's where it gets strange. If we now make a measurement and we try to, well, let's see, let's make a measurement of the energy of this, this string, this, this state. If we do that, that's what happens. And it collapses into that state. So it stops making a noise. And it also stops making a noise because is that oscillating, Sean? No. That's what we call a stationary state. And we've dropped the system into that state. That's weird. That's really weird. Moreover, that's if we make a measurement of energy. If we make a measurement, say, of position, all hell breaks loose. So let me slow this down as well, so this will make more sense to you. So we'll reset it, we'll run it. And now if I measure position and slow it all the way down, so you can see how it evolves, just what's happening. Right, so that's it. So now we've measured, we've found our particle is here, but that's just a ton of waves. If we now let the system, of, I've, I've, I've stopped it in time, now I'm going to let it just move forward in time. And all those waves are spreading out, which is what would happen on a string as well. The, the, the waves, you know, if you pluck it here, obviously the waves travel that way, they travel that way. And they hit the ends of the, the string, they hit the walls, they bounce back. And all those different modes are now interfering with each other. If we speed it up. We get all those different modes all interacting with each other. Now we've got a superposition of very many states. But now again, if we decide we're going to measure the energy, bang. It collapses into one state with a certain probability. And we, we know the maths in terms of how to work out what the probability of it going into that state or a different state is. The difficulty is we don't know why it does that. When we make a measurement of position, what we do is we, we find that what we're doing is saying that, well, because we now made a measurement of position, we know that the particle is in a certain region of space. But that is just another wave. That's just like when you pluck a string. Imagine plucking a string, localized little point. So that means that is a sum of that plus that, plus that, plus that, plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we now have is this plethora of different modes vibrating, and that's when you get this mess. 
And then, you know, this is why, if you think of it in terms of waves, quantum mechanics is, I wouldn't say it's simple, but it makes a hell of a lot more sense than if you think of it like this. Because if you ask yourself, I've got a particle in a box, which is what we're representing with this, and you ask what its trajectory is, look at that. If I were to say, how is it moving? It's very, very difficult because you've got all these different waves interfering. Quantum mechanics is fundamentally about waves, hence wave mechanics. And this superposition idea, although it's really complicated to understand in terms of objects like that, which are classical objects we're interested in, if we think of it in terms of waves, it makes a hell of a lot more sense. If we just scroll forward in time, we can see that as things start to happen, we get to this point where everything starts to reroute. And rather than going directly to Facebook, you can start to see it. W. This is some actual ciphertext that we'll be breaking later. Does it honestly start with Zeus, as in Conrad's Zeus? Yes. In the reality of random. Yeah, yeah, yeah.